Bill. I'm Bill Herrick, and this is meeting number 246 of PMG's in America. Thank you for coming out on a cold day. Stay warm. It's warm and snowy. I do appreciate your time. Item number one. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> So good to see you all. Okay, item number two. Dan, think about a day for me to come over to your house. Okay? Up to four help desk items. Okay? Seriously. Okay. John. Okay. Before we leave, we get a date set when you're coming over and we get the new year. Okay? It's a new year. I want to get those last to do's for last year. Aren't you just making the first to do this year? Everybody else will. The first thing we'll do is we'll just talk about what the agenda is today. The main presentation will be on iCloud troubleshooting. I, again, will be your main presenter. The novice group, no longer novice clinic, we decided the people that go to the novice group are not sick. It's just novice group. Uh, will be moderated by Don Baldiff today, and Don's going to be just Don's up there waving. Are you waving or are you threatening us? Okay. <coughs> he hasn't recovered from the cold. Anyway. Don will be moderating the, the novice group, and his topic is going to be the wonders of text edit. What? Wonders of text edit. Text edit is a word processor that comes with your Mac. Okay. And you can do all sorts of neat stuff with it. Is it on your iPad? Not on your iPad, it's on your Mac. We need to put that in as a topic. Simple word processors for the iPad? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to ask okay. questions about that today. Okay. So, anyway, so that's who will be doing what. Okay. <coughs> Next thing. We go to news. Uh, just so you're aware, we've had a series of updates to the Mac operating system and the programs that go with it. One of the things that was pushed out by Apple, normally our software updates are things where our computer is pulling it in and it says there's an update and we say yes and it downloads it and installs it. This was the first time that Apple pushed out an update without asking your permission. And the reason they did that was because it was a vulnerability found in the Unix operating system. Uh, it's been there since 1975. <laughs> Somebody spotted it, and it has to do with a uh, three-letter acronym is NTP, Network Time Protocols. Okay. And it has to do with how your computer knows what time it is. They talk to other computers to find out what time it is. There are computers on the internet whose sole purpose is to serve as time servers. Just as uh, in the United States, if you went to the Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C., said hello to Joe Biden, because you know the vice presidential mansions on the grounds, there is an atomic clock there at the Naval Observatory, by which everybody's supposed to synchronize their time up. There's also another one out in Colorado somewhere. Okay. So time, very important thing for civilizations to have a handle on time. So Apple pushed that, that update out. There's also been at least one update for Microsoft Office 2011 that was pushed out that was a security update. And there have also been updates for what used to be called the iWork programs, which would be pages, numbers, and email. <coughs> and that goes for the iPads and for the OS X, the, the Mac computers. And it's all fixing stuff with iCloud <coughs> and iCloud Drive and a whole bunch of other things that I don't quite understand. So just be aware that, you know, there are some updates that are out there. Okay. 
Other new items, uh, coming events. Uh, for the, this is not TMG specific, this is just sort of like our civilization specific. <laughs> the media will be talking about this year two different things in technology, other than the new television sets that they want to talk about. One of them is what's called the Internet of Things. That's where your toaster, your car, your refrigerator, your furnace, your thermostat are going to be able to talk to the internet and interact with the internet. <coughs> IOT, Internet of Things. Okay. So beware of that one. The other one to be aware of is what's called wearable devices. Wearable computers. The Apple Watch is an example of wearable computing technology. The Google Eyeglass or Eye Google Glass, that's an example of wearable technology. Okay. Intel at the Consumer Electronics Show just showed a computer on a USB stick. It looks like a USB drive. It's got a complete computer in it. <coughs> so again, we're getting to the point where the computers are going to be so small we'll be able to wear it as a watch or a brooch. And the challenge with all this is how do you interact with the device? Right. Keyboards, that's not going to cut it if it's wearable technology. <laughs> so, just be aware that these are the, the things that they'll be, they'll be uh, working on and trying to sell you. <laughs> yes, sir. The, the loop second debacle that everybody is <laughs> They're already doing it ahead of time. Right? Yeah. They're making a big deal out of it. Okay. Um, how many of you remember when we were in last century and we were getting ready to come into this century? And we had the uh, Y2K, Y2K bug. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's another similar thing that has to do, it uh, doesn't affect Unix systems, it's only uh, PCs, right? Yeah. So if you're running a, a, a Microsoft operating system or there's one or two Linux operating systems, they don't understand that where you, because of the adjustment, okay, human systems and natural systems don't work the same way. You know, the planet revolves around the sun, it does what it's going to do. We try to impose our time systems upon it and we end up with these adjustments. So just as we have that extra day, we add to February every so often, and we have leap years, you know, where you add an extra, there's this extra second that has to get added. But when they were doing the operating system, Bob and Redmond, they didn't remember that. <laughs> Before it happened, they incrementally moved ahead, you know, however small amounts, yeah. until when it hits that, when they make the change, it's hitting the same thing so the computers understand that it's yeah. correct. So it's, it's just be aware that people are going to talk about, oh my God, the leap second. <laughs> no, just so <laughs> All right. Um, you may also know that, yes. Can I, can I return to the Internet of Things? Sure. A it scares the hell out of me, security-wise. Mm -hmm. um, there was just a report that surfaced in the last month or so of hackers getting into a German steel mill and basically causing a meltdown in the furnace. They mm -hmm. screwed up the control system. <clears throat> And I, I just have to wonder when every smart picture frame, refrigerator, whatever, has software in it that has <coughs> a vulnerable NTP in it, mm -hmm. who's going to update that five-year-old appliance? Or what if we're using cars to drive themselves? <laughs> right. <laughs> so if Rich is taking us back to that topic of Internet of Things, IoT. Um, 
there's a lot of thought that has to go into what devices are appropriate to have connected to the internet and whether they're going to interact with the internet. So for example, let's say I'm in a Boeing Dreamliner. Okay. There's got a lot of computers in it. Is it really appropriate to have that thing connected to the internet where, you know, people can update the firmware for the Dreamliner as it's flying? I don't, I don't see that as much a problem with, you know, an airliner because they're under pretty strict a maintenance and right now. regime. But, you know, that Pepsi machine <laughs> over there, yeah. you know, nobody's maintain, watching it to make sure its software is not correct. Right. Yeah, and, Go ahead. Yeah. Oh. And the other thing is a lot of stuff is now being controlled by tablets and stuff. There's an app for that. Mm -hmm. Well, five years hence, are you still going to be able to have your <coughs> front panel yeah. that talks to your device? Yeah. Obsolescence. Uh, your comment about flying airplanes. Did anybody watch the Nova special on drones recently? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Navy has no man in the cockpit. Landed the plane, or taken the plane off, and landed it on an aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. No person, no man in the loop, autonomously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your comment about airplanes not being there, they're there. Yeah. Autonomous is a little bit different from Internet of Things. Internet of Things, it would be you've got a global predator drone, okay, and it's feeding back video. And the bad guys are able to also see the video and able to control the drone, take control of our global predator and have it shoot a missile that way instead of that way or crash it. So, you know, there's, there's that. Because, you know, we had that problem with the... drone uh, landed in Iran. Well, I wasn't thinking of the one that landed in Iran. I was thinking more about where they were uh, able to... Uh, the the communication link to the drones was not encrypted. And you had an instance of some folks in Afghanistan with a Toshiba satellite. It's a old crappy laptop and some Wi-Fi stuff were able to see what the feed was and were able to warn people ahead of time, hey, they're heading over to hill such and such. You know, okay, now they're looking this way. Okay, you can run. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, just be aware, you know, part of the, the goal of the group is to make you aware of some of the things coming down the pipe, technology. And it's important that you be aware of this so you can make informed <coughs> choices. All right. Do you want to have your car connected to the internet and be able to communicate with you? So when you're shopping at Kroger, you have the refrigerator telling you, hey, we're low on milk, buy some milk. And your car's whining about, hey, you know, I really need this oil change, and my left front tire's a little low. Meanwhile, you know, you're on the cell phone trying to, you know, or texting, you know, with your significant other to find out where they are in the mega store. Okay. So, Internet of Things and wearable computers. Anybody want to guess what the set will be in about 15 years after we're all doing wearable technology? You know, we got the brooch or whatever, and there's the roll feed. It's a little bit implanted. Implanted. Yeah, implanted. Implanted. That'll be the next one. That's where it really gets scary because we'll have the ability to essentially, through technology, have an entire human race communicating telepathically. Okay. In other words, I will be in your head and you will be in my head. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did anyone else have anything they wanted to add to the uh, uh, news, new items? I think I got everything. Yeah, I meant to bring this earlier to you. This was from uh, Popular Science January of 99. Okay. <laughs> On the heels of its successful <coughs> introduction, Apple Computer has a new operating system for the Macintosh faithful. This, come, this one comes with its own detective, OS 8.5, so that's, <coughs> yeah, 
includes Sherlock. Yep. How has that morphed? What has that morphed to? Okay. When you think of Sherlock Holmes, you think of the deerstalker hat, okay, the pipe, and the magnifying glass. When you're doing a spotlight search, what's the icon you use? Magnifying glass. Sherlock was one of the first search technologies. There were two graduate students at Stanford who went, you know, that's sort of a, you, you could do a lot better with this. And as one of their ma uh, master's thesis, uh, they started messing around with search algorithms and what you could do. And they started applying that to the internet. And they got one of their professors to kick in some cash because they needed more hardware to do it. Uh, that became Google today. By the way, the professor that bankrolled them, you never hear about him, but he owns a third of what became Google. So, so sometimes, you know, it's important to, if you're a uh, faculty, you know, listen to the students, you know, sometimes, you know, maybe, you know, if they need a little money, yeah, it might be a good idea to help them with it. Yes, Rob. I have another question. Um, the same article had, or had an information about a minuscule combination lock developed at Sandia National Labs, virtually impenetrable computer firewall or barrier, basically with a hardware device. Okay. Does anybody have any information on this? Because it says... Have you ever seen a Tempest-rated system? Oh, yeah, I've worked with With the Fer Faraday cage? That was the super hardware device. They basically put an entire building in a Faraday cage. And then for the internet connection... Okay, let me see. I meant, this to, get this, I meant to get this to you before, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. One hacker's out, lock the door. It just sounds interesting. It's like it's a mechanical damage. Portable locking device. Okay, basically it's a it's a lie. Yeah, that is a I just wondered if anybody had heard of it. Um, I don't think it went anywhere. Or did, or did it go someplace and disappear? No. It, it, what happened was it turned out there was a way to subvert it okay. through mechanical means. Yeah. Okay. Okay. In the future, just see me ahead of time. Give me a try. I apologize. Okay. I'm going to say if nobody else has anything else new they want to talk about, <coughs> then we move on to help us. Anybody got problems? <laughs> okay. Everybody in the room. Everybody in the room. Well, what is that German term for those who enjoy pleasure from seeing other people? Yeah, you know, come on. It's 2015. As a human race, we're supposed to have, you know, improved ourselves. All right, we're going to go to Kathy Bean first, and then we'll go to Ray Ratchford. I have two questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one of which is uh, pages. Whenever I updated my uh, iPad and my my new phone, I got pages on the iPhone as well as um, a couple other programs I haven't bothered with. Uh -huh. But they didn't put it on my computer, so that when I do something on pages, I can't. I, I'm having trouble getting it to my computer mm -hmm. and, and using it. And it's a great program. I'd love to. Do I have okay. to buy it? Um, you can buy it in the Apple Store. Um, yeah, but why didn't they give it to me free? They gave it to me free on my phone. They, my... What operating system do you have? It's Mountain Lion or Yosemite? They're now Yosemite. On Yosemite. Everything's on Yosemite. She should be able to get it when she uploaded it. Is that Yosemite? Yeah. On the computer? Yeah. It's not there. No, you okay. should go to the App Store. You make you have to go to App Store and check your updates. And it, will I pay for it? No, it, usually it comes free with the uh, Yosemite. Yeah. yeah. I'll show you how to do that. Okay, right. You're going to do that at the break? Yeah. <coughs> okay, cool. All right, now we're going to go to Ray Ranch. Uh, 
Uh, in the past, when we were like reading an article on, on a website or something, there was a little spot where you put in your address and you could change it to just text. Yeah. What happened to that? Okay. <laughs> so, Ray's talking about you're looking at something on the internet <coughs> with your web browser Safari. Okay. Safari. So that's the program that's running. And they had a thing where you could click on it, it would go into reader mode. So, pretend you're looking at the front page of the of, uh, New York Times. Okay? And if you're looking at the front page of the New York Times on their website, they've got videos over here, they've got ads over here, they've got stuff, you know, banners going across the top. When you clicked reader mode, it would show you just the content of the article and the graphics associated with that article, reader mode. What they did was, and again, I don't understand the 30-somethings that are doing this programming at Apple, because they change stuff without telling us. All right, so if I bring up Safari here, okay, so here's Safari. And I've got a web page going here. So I'm going to go to full screen just so it's nice and big for everybody. All right. In the view menu, if reader function is available, it's about, uh, the, about halfway down the screen. Let me see if I can get to the New York Times here. File, new tab. Okay, now well, what do we got here? Uh, yeah, let's see, let's see if we can do it with maybe Yahoo. Um, the website you're looking at has to have certain code on it for reader mode to work. So here, I'm going to bring up this article. I have no idea what it is. Four men shot dead in San Francisco. Oh, Flash is out of date. Oh, dear. <laughs> So I go to view, and then I say, show reader. So it takes that article that had all of the other eye candy around it, and it shows you just the stuff in the article. Now, what's also nice about it is, once I'm in reader mode, if I bring my pointer onto the screen, I can make the text bigger or smaller. <coughs> okay. Looks like they took the function out that I wanted to show. It used to be that you could then email the reader view of it to somebody. There's a icon up on top there. The arrow on it. Over, 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 over this way. Ah, okay. They put it up here. So I've got the... I can uh, email the page, I can send it as a message, I can airdrop it, Twitter it, post it on Facebook, LinkedIn, blah, blah, blah. What's the other one? That's the downloads I had. Okay, I don't need to see any of that. Fine. To get out of it, view hide reader. So it's holding your shift key. Your command key and the letter R takes you out of reader mode. Shift key, command key, and the letter R puts you into reader mode. Typically, you're going to see it implemented on sites that are vending news. It might be TMZ, and it's you know the latest thing that uh, Beyonce dress or you know some few. <laughs> But you know, it's still considered to be a news site. Or if it's grayed out in the view menu, that means that the website you're looking at does not have the code in it so that you can uh, use it. Again, you want to make sure you're actually on the article. So, for example, if I'm just here and I go on down and I say show reader, it's going to work because I'm in that article out of it here. Now, let me just go just to Yahoo News, where we're sort of in the generic, you know, eye candy. 
You got ads, you got video, you got all this stuff going on. If I go up to my view menu now, reader is grayed out. In other words, you got to be in an actual article. So if we go down here, let's see. Let's see. Where is something that is like fun to? It's all death destruction. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Did Apple future. just show us the future? Okay. So here I am, and I'm in that article, and I go to view, and I say, "Hey, show reader." Okay. I'm, I'm glad we used this one. Notice that when you are in Reader, it doesn't just show you the text. If there are graphics appropriately inserted into the article, it'll show those too. And they used to have a thing where you could just click and okay, they keep showing stuff on you. So again, that's Command Shift and R to get into Reader mode, Command Shift R to get out of it. It's one of those toggle things. Same command will get you in or out of it. No. Yeah. Uh, there's an outfit, uh, unofficial Apple something or other. The know? unofficial Apple website, Tua. Okay. T-U-A-W. Right. I got into that just a day or so ago, and they were talking about Apple and how they think that they're trying to do too much too fast and their quality levels and so forth. It was uh, rather critical. Um, still think they're the best, but they're slipping. And when you made the comment, I don't understand why these 30-somethings, that's okay. really what that article was about. Um, once upon a time, I was a programmer. Granted, it was when the dinosaurs still roamed the earth. <laughs> Um, you know, in the era of Snowball and Fortran and Cobol and PL1 and such. But while, while you would do the coding, there were other people who would look at the code before it got rolled out. Stuff got tested a little bit better. And I just don't get that feel of, you know, American Society for Quality, you know, ISO type standards, protocols, being implemented with what they're doing with the operating system. And the reason I say that is very simple. I'll go into where I used to be able to do something in Mavericks, and I'll see that the thing isn't there. And then I'll do the little search for help to show me what it is. And I'll see that the help article hasn't been updated to show me how to do it in Yosemite. It's still referring Mavericks or it's referring mountain lion, which says to me that they're not doing due diligence. That's exactly what that article yeah. thought you, about. The coding is not done until the paperwork, the documentation is done. I had a boss who used a uh, bathroom analogy on that, but I won't share that with you. <laughs> <laughs> paperwork's not, you know, the job's not done until the paperwork's done. Yes, please. I have another question. Uh, whenever we updated to Yosemite, mm -hmm. we in the mail program, I used to be able to get any notes that I had written on my iPad. And those aren't there anymore. Okay. The notes are going to be seen in the notes program that's in Yosemite. All right. Now, this is the part of what they're doing. They're taking the mobile operating system, iPhone OS, iOS, and they're taking OS X, the Mac operating system, and they're taking the programs that are in those two operating systems, and they're making them so they talk to each other and work much more the same. An example of some of the things they've done. Back in the days of Snow Leopard, if I wanted to look up somebody's address, I'd be in a program called Address Book. Well, it's been renamed to be Contacts because that's the name they were using in iOS. iCal in OS X is now Calendars. Okay. The mail program is mail program. But what they did in OS X was they took things out of the mail program that were being handled uh, 
it, it, it worked, but it really wasn't a great implementation. And they strip it out and make it its own application. So there was a task list that you could do in calendars. That's now off to the side, separate program called Reminders. Reminders on OS X, Reminders on iOS. The two talk to each other. So if I put a new reminder on my Mac, oh, my iOS device is going to show me that reminder. So you want to look for a program called Notes. Notes. And the icon is sort of like a yellow legal yeah, pad. Yeah. And your notes should be showing up in there. Okay. Who else had? Yes, John. I have a, uh, an iMac and I have a second monitor. Uh, on it, so I'm doing a software development work. I have lots of screen space to work in. Okay. Every once in a while, uh, the second monitor is physically and logically set up to be left of the of the main monitor. Okay. Um, the bottom edges are aligned. The top edges are a little bit different because the heights of the monitors yeah. are different. Different physical devices. Uh, every, my problem is every once in a while the dock, which is centered at the bottom of the main monitor, will jump over to the other monitor. I haven't been, it happened repeatedly, but I haven't been able to reproduce it. I don't know what I do that makes it happen. And what OS are you running? Uh, Mavericks. Ten uh, ten. They put it on both. There too, is right? a keystroke. Oh, do you have a magic mouse? Do you have one of the fancy? You've got a Kindle and trackball. Okay. And most likely, it's a keystroke you're doing. There is a keyboard shortcut that says, oh, take the dock that's in this window and put it over there. In other words, the other window becomes the primary, first window becomes the secondary window. Okay. Off the top of my head, I do not remember what well, that key is. That's not true. I can look it up probably. The easiest, you know, how to, you know how to undo it though, right? You go into your monitor control thing and you just drag that dock. So chances are you're doing some sort of keyboard shortcut. Usually it happens when I'm not hitting the keyboard, but... Uh, <laughs> oh, no. You might, have a, you might have a keyboard shortcut map to a mouse yeah. button. Could be. I don't know of anything like that, but it's a possibility. Did you have something you wanted to add, Ron? Uh, a general calendar question. Okay. And maybe this is not something to be answered now, but I... <clears throat> I'm confused by a lot of things, and one of them is I have uh, you know, a Google account, and another party uh, put me on notice of a meeting every month, mm -hmm. and I get an email message from Google. Uh, I'm not sure how they did that. Uh, my son uh, has a preschool daughter, and the school calendar uh, is able to be linked to his mm -hmm. Mac devices. His shared. It's his, a shared calendar. But it's just, you know, her grade level, anything that's going on mm -hmm. today, this week, shows up on his calendar. Mm -hmm. uh, I belong to some other organizations. You know, how can you pull from another calendar onto your calendar? Uh, how, how can you sort out all okay. this when there's so many different calendar okay. applications out there? Okay. Been there, done that, my eyes crossed until I figured out the epiphany. Okay. The sky opened up, the light came down, and I went, aha, now I understand what's going on. The first web surface that most of us used was email. Okay, so I'm going to use American Online. Remember American Online? You know, they had to get the Sunday paper. There was another CD, okay, or floppy disk. Okay, instrument. Right there. You want some of those? Okay, <laughs> America Online email. When I log in to America Online with my web browser and I'm looking at my mail, ignoring all the other stuff they throw at me. It says, oh, contacts, you know, address book, calendar, notes, tasks, all sorts of things like that. 
Those are all stored with my email stuff on my account on AOL. Okay. If I go over to Google and I have a Gmail account, oh, calendar, address book, notes, tasks, uh, superstar messages, uh, not so super messages. Okay. If I go over to Yahoo, I've got a Yahoo email, same deal. If I go over to Apple, oh, I've got an Apple email, oh, and there's a calendar, and there's contacts. Okay. So what you've got is all of these different services from different companies providing me what I think is the same thing, a calendar. Now, what if instead of using a web browser to talk to AOL to get my email, what if I use the Apple Mail program, what's called an email client? Oh, hey, I can have that looking at the email at America Online and my Yahoo and my Google in my uh, Outlook, okay? And I'm looking at all in one inbox, even though they're on separate services, separate inboxes. <coughs> so, then what we do is we look at the calendar program. So you're, uh, specifically, we're on a Mac, and we're using the calendar program on a Mac. We can configure that to look at other services from other companies. But this is where the na 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 stuff comes in. Okay, who's being friendly with who? It used to be Apple and Google best friends forever. Okay, okay, and when did they, the, the romance there break up and members of the board that were on the Google board and the Apple board had a, got kicked off and they couldn't do it anymore? Oh, Google came out with their own phone. Okay. After they had seen the iPhone, what was coming out. Okay. So then you get, Apple goes, well, you know, Google, we're not going to necessarily allow all of your stuff on our stuff. So let me just bring up one little system preference on a Mac to sort of show you the range of stuff that's available. So I'm going to go into system preferences. I'm going to go into iCloud. Hello. Excuse me. Let me go back here a minute. I'll do the other one instead. I'll go into Internet Accounts. <coughs> oh, okay. I'm in a, a thing where I don't really have anything configured up. Um. Nobody free comes switching my user profile, so I'm going into my William Herrick account here. Okay. I was logged in as TMG. Now I'm logged in as William Herrick. And let me do the same thing here. Let's just bring up contacts. Okay, so I'm in contacts, address book. I click on accounts. Right now I just have iCloud showing my contacts. If I click the plus, oh, I could have all of the people that are my friends on Facebook show up in my contacts program. I could have the folks at LinkedIn, Google, Yahoo, but you don't see AOL. Okay. Now, let's bring up the calendar program. So now I'm in calendar. Let me close this one out. Okay, so I'm in calendar. I go into preferences. Damn you, Garmin, I don't need to know. 
cancel, cancel, close it out. So I'm in system preferences for calendars. I click plus, I click go, let's do Google. Continue, William Herrick, my name, and then I would have to put in my Google email account name. Okay, so I'm in calendar, I'm in system preferences, I'm on the accounts tab, I've clicked and put in my Google contact information. These are the services from Google that I can link to my Mac and the programs that are there. The mail program, so if I click that, my Google Mail shows up in my mail client, Apple Mail. If I click contacts, Anything in my Google address book will also show up in my contacts. Calendar, messages, and notes. Okay. Now, this is the good part of it. It's one place where all my stuff will show up. The bad part of it is that you get confused about what's connected to what. So, example. Let's say it's the school district, your granddaughter, great granddaughter, great. granddaughter. Okay, granddaughter. Okay, maybe that's being shared from Google. So you can only get it if you've got Google Gmail and a Google Calendar. Okay. All right, so I turn calendar on. So now it's showing up in my calendar app, but I forget that it's coming from Google and I try and change it on maybe my AOL calendar or whatever. And I can, I'm going like, okay, what's going on here? It's, yeah, the data is available, <coughs> it's available to me, but I forget where it's coming <coughs> from. Okay, so that's the downside of it. Because I'm an incredibly flawed human being with very limited mental capacity, I mean, it's getting worse every day, I do not put anything into my Google Calendar. Okay, I've got a Google email account. I do not use the Google Calendar. I use my <coughs> Microsoft Outlook Calendar and I use the Apple Calendar. Those are the only two places where I put things. The Microsoft Outlook I use exclusively for work items. The Apple Calendar I use exclusively for personal things. So then, then you have the thing that shows up You've got all the different colors for different calendars that show up in your calendar <coughs> app. Okay. If I want to change the color of a Google calendar, I got to log into Google to change the color of that calendar or change the name of it. So there's there's advantages to having everything going into a central spot. There's disadvantages. Another example. Okay, I've got Facebook turned on from my address book. Okay. I've got Google turned on for my address book. I've got AOL turned on for my address book. I've got Yahoo turned on for my address book. Guess what? Ron Decker's in all five address books. So then you show up five places in contacts. But Apple has provided sort of a solution for that. I can click on those two entries. The one from Ron Decker on Facebook, Ron Decker on Gmail, Ron Decker on AOL. I can click on those and say, link those together and treat them as if they're one. Then what happens is, if I change something on it, and I have changed rights, permissions, it'll change it on my Google, uh, Google address book and my Apple contact book and my AOL contact book. Okay? So, do, do you see? Yeah. Does that help? Yes. Okay. This is why we get confused very quickly. The other thing, just adding on top of that, is when you're able to share a calendar with people. All right. 
The folks that I know who normally do this are administrative assistants, you know, the secretaries who really run our major corporations. Okay. Most CEOs that I know do not have right privileges to their calendars. <laughs> they have read-only privileges. Their administrative assistant is the one who's allowed to post something on their calendar or move something or take something off. So it can be very frustrating. You're looking at a calendar, you think you own it, but no, it's actually coming from someone else. You don't have right permissions. You can only read it. You can't change it. Okay? Does that sort of help? A little bit, yes. Okay. Now I'm wondering if there are back doors. If, you know, this organization will communicate with somebody that this organization won't. Can you? go through another route to get this calendar to link to your it, um, it opens up a lot there, there, more possibility. There, there, there are instances where if you know where someone is, you know their calendar, you know who they're meeting with, when they're meeting with, why they're meeting with someone, and sometimes calendars have that amount of information on it, that you can make money off of that. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking in terms of uh, stock manipulation, that sort of thing. Or let's say you just want to target someone for assassination, and you got their calendar, and you know where they're going to be, and you know they got to get there somehow. You know, they're coming from Washington, and they're going into Kabul. Uh, chances are they're going to be going by plane. You know, you can sort of figure out what flight they'll be on. See what I'm saying? So yeah, again. <coughs> Uh, this sort of stuff is very, very valuable information, and that's why the NSA has been scoping up calendar data since um, 1980. Yeah, Rich. I don't want to go anywhere near deep on this at all. Okay. But if I wanted to set up an independent calendar or contact service, <coughs> I would be playing on that. Dave? Web Dave. Yeah. Web Dave. Yeah, one of those servers. Can that be hooked in here somewhere? Uh, you can do it with your current. You don't have to run your own separate web app. Mm -hmm. If you want to share a calendar with people, uh -huh. you can create a separate calendar on Google, whatever, and then say share. And I want to run my own server as possible. Okay. If you're going to do that, I would not recommend using the Apple server software to do it. Uh -huh. I would say uh, just put a, a lamp box together. Yeah. Okay, and you can do web dev. And so the answer is here somewhere there is an other choice, and you can. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. I'm, people are pointing at watches. Let's do Jim Horn, and then we'll move on. In calendar, when you're sharing through Google. Yeah. Is there a way to merge five or six calendars that are kept separate up at Google down to a single calendar on a shared Apple calendar application? Yeah. What, what you would do is you would log in, say I want to add an account, put in the person's Google login mm -hmm. and their password and say calendar, and then click the plus button, hit Google, put in another person's name, their login for Google and their password, and say calendar. And all of those calendars will show up in your calendar app. But I want to make them show up on the one of the viewers as a single calendar. <coughs> oh, then what you want to do is you want to share the calendar. OK, let, let me just real quick here. Cancel. Cancel <coughs> calendars. <coughs> okay, just zooming in real quick here. Okay, I have a calendar on my Mac called US Holidays, and it's got this symbol that looks like waves in a pond. That's a shared calendar. I can't write to it, but I can read it. Now, I'm going to zoom out a little bit and go up a little bit here. So I'm just 
putting my pointer up on top of my home calendar, if I want to share that with people, see the wave thing showed up? I just come out there and I click on that wave and I say, who do I want to share that calendar with? And I put in an email address for that person. They're going to get a little thing that says, hey, do you want to? And then they got to figure out what calendar program they're going to put it into. Are they going to be using it inside calendar functions inside Microsoft Outlook on a PC or a Mac? Or are they going to be on a Linux box? Are they going to be using, I'm trying to think of a calendar program, Sunrise, which is a pretty nice calendar program on a Linux box. Okay, so you want to be careful when you're clicking around on your calendars in your calendar. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to click done. Um, the one thing I never do is make it a public calendar. Public calendar means that anybody can subscribe to it. You only do that if you're a large corporation. You're a baseball team, and you want people to know when the team's going to be where. Okay? And that way they can put it on their calendar. So let's say they're a road warrior, you know, executive, they travel a lot, they can go, hey, I'm in Chicago, hey. You know, the Yankees are going to play the Cubs. Okay, cool. You know, Cubs suck, Yankees great, you know, whatever. And Steve Jobs used to uh, organize his trips, so he would specifically be in certain towns because he loved baseball. Okay, with that said, we are finished with help desk. We are finished with news. I'm seeing a lot of frowning faces. I think I, I just overwhelmed some people. Okay. So it's going to be time to do raffle, I think. Out of the room so they don't have to listen to me yammers. If you're interested, iCloud troubleshooting that's here. Rod, you got to decide which one you want to do. Whichever one you think you're going to get the most value out of. I would strongly remind you that our presentations have been videotaped for eight years now. So You've been videotaping presentations? Eight years. Eight years. Mark Georges has very patiently been videotaping the presentations. We have most of those available if you want them uh, put onto a DVD. And our latest thing is they are available through our website via YouTube. Okay. How far back did they go on to YouTube? Do you have them back a year? Four, four months. Four months. Four months. Four months. Yeah, unless I want some, if somebody wants to spend three hours uploading and three hours for each meeting, well, 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 they, yeah. <laughs> I'll be I'll be ninety eight, but. <laughs> So it brings up just the question of, of additional help. There's two areas where I need additional help. Okay, One of them is if you're interested in assisting uh, Colonel Georges with uploading stuff to YouTube, talk to Mark Georges. The other one is I also need someone, or maybe two someones, to show up earlier for the meetings to help us with setup. Set up. Uh, we had a member, uh, Ernest Anderson, who for 20 years showed up when I did and helped me set up all the tables. And it, it, uh, I, I need help with that. Set up and tear down. I mean, normally yeah, we don't set have up a problem with tear down, but if somebody needs to know what has to be done to tear down, we always get asked, what do we do? Yeah. Um, Okay, so anyway, think about that. If you're so inclined, please let us know. It would be very helpful. Oh, the reason why, the other reason why, not just that I'm getting old and I can't do the tables by myself, I've decided that I need to change how we do the meetings, the pre-meeting part. <coughs> What I've noticed is, before the meeting starts, there's another whole meeting where people specifically want to talk to me about something. Okay. If my focus is on putting chairs in place and trying to move tables and set up other stuff, 
that means I have to focus on that. If I've got other people to help me do the setup, that means that I can stand over there. And as people come in and say, you know, Bill, I don't really want to talk about this in the meeting, but I'm interested in such and such presentation idea, or hey, you know, I need help with such and such, so that I can do more of the meet and greet stuff that the president of the organization really should do. Okay. What so with that said, up? what time do you show up? <sighs> I'm here at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, so I'm over at Bill's Donuts at 8 o'clock picking up the donuts. Then I drive over here, depending on what traffic's like. Uh, I'm here 8.15, 8.30, uh, and I'm setting up tables, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this morning, Mark Georges was very gracious to show up early and help me because he knew that I uh, slipped and fell Tuesday and my back has been... Uh, so we have two guys with bad backs back. putting the tables up. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> and so Mark Georges said, you know, Bill, you need to, to mature and learn when to ask for help. Okay. And so I'm taking what he says. Yes, ma'am. How about if you tell us where the chairs go? Last time they went back there, we all just took our chair, put a, one chair back yeah. here. Um, the <coughs> folks at uh, Good Shepherd now have a little table, a uh, little diagram of where they want the tables left at the end of the meeting. Okay. And so that's in three different locations. So the people who are interested in Which helping them do breakdown will be talking <coughs> about that afterwards. Meanwhile, Presentation time. Okay, we're going to be doing iCloud troubleshooting, and everybody should be, you know, turning off their phones. And I have a new phone. I no longer have a flip phone. Uh, my daughter did an intervention. She took my flip phone away. Did you get an iPhone? No, I did not get an iPhone. I am not smart enough to operate an iPhone. <laughs> um, cell phones are not my forte. I have just entered the world of texting, and so I've got an LG phone with a slide-out keyboard. And I'm learning how to use this bit by bit. Okay, so let's get on to the important stuff. Okay, so first thing, of course, Happy New Year. Pray for peace. This is going to be a rocky year, I have a feeling, the way it started out. Okay, our presentation goals for provide you with detailed iCloud troubleshooting documents. The reason why you need those, troubleshooting these various services is not easy. And for me to go through the procedure would take several hours. It's better for me to point you to the resources you need to have and checklists of what to follow. Second thing is to point out two excellent books on iCloud because some of us still read books, so it's important to have that. To identify the many helpful iCloud resources on the Apple website, and that's actually part of the troubleshooting flowchart. And last but not least, to provide a paradigm for your mind <coughs> to be used when iCloud troubleshooting. That may sound sort of pretentious, but when you have that paradigm, when you have a model to use when you're approaching a certain problem, it really can clarify things. So those are the four things we're going to do in this presentation. Anybody have any questions or issues with that agenda so far? Let's go twice. Okay, we're good. Okay, so let's talk about those troubleshooting documents. These will all be part of the standard email package that we send out after the meeting. So there's one, two, three, four documents. iCloud account troubleshooting, calendar troubleshooting, contacts troubleshooting, and document troubleshooting. Typically, that's what people are sharing mostly via iCloud, you know, syncing their contacts, their address book stuff, their calendar events, their, or they have a problem with the account itself, or it's some other document that they're trying to uh, sync. The fifth thing that's in the package is called iCloud Apple Support.weblloc. 
It's a file. When you double click on it, it's going to launch your default browser and take you to the Apple Support Central for iCloud. Sometimes we get tired of typing this stuff in. This is a nice little thing to just have there. You double click on it. It's like a bookmark that looks like a file. I'll put it that way. And then last but not least, you'll have a PDF in there, which is this presentation, a PowerPoint presentation, but in a PDF form. OK, so two books that I really like about iCloud. The first one is Take Control of iCloud. This is from Tidbits. It's by Joe Kissel. It's about 15 bucks. But because you're a TMG member and because we have discounts with Tidbits, I think it's only 10 bucks for a member of TMG. So go out to those discount pages that we've got on the website. And the other one, this is an electronic book. The other one is an actual physical book, and it's from Peach Pit Press, and it's a visual quick start guide. There's a whole series of these books out there. It's by Tom Negrino, and it's about 20 bucks if you buy it on Amazon. Uh, you can also get it in electronic form. I think it's a little bit less if you're buying it. Again, Peach Pit Press is one of those organizations where they have been very gracious to provide us with discounts. So check the website. OK, and let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. OK, and talked about price, gave the people's names, club discounts for both. OK, got it all. Moving on to the next one. All right. So the back muscles are kicking up. If you hear this sort of strange whimper noise, just ignore it. It's me. All right. This is Support Central for iCloud on the web, Apple website. It's www.apple.com slash support slash iCloud. Okay. This is the mother load for iCloud resources for normal people on the mothership. Back in the dark days of Apple, when people like Michael <coughs> Dell said, you know, if they were really going to be fair to the shareholders, they'd just close up Apple and give them their money back and just you know, give up business. There were people like me who were still Apple fanatics and they thought we were a little strange, so they used to talk about how we were, you know, like, alien, if you will. And they used to talk about Apple being the mothership. Well, I think Steve Jobs, when he was working with the architects for the new Apple headquarters that they're building, they're getting pretty close to uh, having about two-thirds of it done, um, I think he took that whole mothership idea uh, a little bit too far. But that's what the new Apple campus is going to look like. OK. Enough said. Moving back along. So here's this resource, www.apple.com slash support slash iCloud. What I think would be best for me to do at this point is to actually take Safari, Go to the website and just sort of walk through some of the stuff that's out there. Because if you're going to troubleshoot, you need help documents, and you need procedurals, and you also need some information. And this is the place you go to to get that kind of info. Excuse me. Yep. I don't use Safari. I use Firefox. Is you can going? use Firefox to go there. You can use Opera to go there. You can use Camino. You can use Chromium. You can use Google Chrome. You can use Internet Explorer. You pick whatever web browser you're happy with. Thank you. OK. So I'm hitting my escape key to get out of my presentation. And I'm bringing up Safari. Now, I'm running Yosemite. And in Yosemite, when we click on the green dot, it takes 
and makes the, uh, the presentation be full screen. Let me just real quick here click on that. Okay. So, we're at www.apple.com slash support slash iCloud. Alright. This over here is a sidebar. So right now I'm on the Welcome tab. They have all sorts of different things talking about if you want to put iCloud on a Windows PC, iCloud and Apple. <coughs> the next one down is Get Started. They've got articles about how to get started with this, and they've got links where you can click on it, and it takes you to the place to set stuff up. Then they've got a sidebar item that talks about accounts. This is specifically about Apple ID accounts, iCloud accounts. You can have an Apple ID. They started out as iTunes IDs and then they became Apple IDs. There's all these different services that Apple provides. They will work with the same account, but you have to start that service up first. So when we get to uh, troubleshooting, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Then about storage, so if you want to buy more storage in iCloud, they've got all these articles about how to do iCloud storage upgrades and downloads and what the price structure is. They've got another thing all about iCloud Drive, another thing about photos, so if you want to be sharing photos via iCloud, including troubleshooting documents. So it's not just where they explain what service the service is and how it works, but also how to get it so it's working properly. Family sharing, that's where you can take different Apple IDs and <coughs> link them together under one Apple ID. Sort of like, you know, you have one responsible adult that manages the account and then these other Apple IDs are associated with it. Find my iPhone, iPad, iPod Touch, or Mac. Backup, iCloud Backup, all these different how-tos and questions about backup, they're available from there. Back to my Mac, another iCloud service where you can go through the internet to your Mac and be able to run your Mac even though you're not physically with your Mac. Case in point. My father has an iMac. My father does not understand how to update Flash. My father lives in Chicago. I don't feel like driving to Chicago every time he tells me Flash needs to be updated. Because I'd be driving to Chicago every week. I turned on back to my Mac. I got it configured. I got it set up. So I can log into his computer. His computer has to be turned on. I can log in, take control, update Flash, do a short FaceTime with them, and then I don't have to drive there. Yes? You said it had to be turned on. Does it have to be out of sleep or to be in sleep mode and you get into it? Um, if it's, it, it, there's, there's a setting in Energy Saver where it says wake on network access, that has to be checked. Okay. Yeah. Um, Back to my Mac is one of these things where it sort of, kind of, sometimes works. The problem is not so much the computers as the network equipment in between the computers. So there are some digital, excuse me, uh, cable modems that will not let that particular communication flow go through. So it's a, uh, eh. To test it, do you, can you test it in your home with the same one, or do you have to be like outside? You have to be in a different location to be able to test that it actually works. Okay. In other words, you need to be on the wide area network, not the local area network. Can you do that through an iPad, or does it have to be another computer? It's computer to computer. Can it be iPad to computer? Um, I believe not. There are other ways to share data between an iPad. Well, let me think. Wait a minute. I'll take that back because I know with my iPad, I can talk to my iMac 
my Mac Mini on my local area network and change what iTunes is playing. Um, through, through that one? That one, I, I, I need to think about that one. <coughs> and maybe go, I, I maybe need to go to the, uh, back to my Mac section and see what they say about uh, set up security, I set up and use back to my Mac and I'll have to read that stuff. Don't have an answer for you right now. Bookmarks and the iCloud tabs. You can have bookmarks being synchronized. Calendar and reminders. Now we're getting into the data that people typically have synced. So you have troubleshooting instructions. You have explanations of how to set up accounts. All of these resources are there. Just Apple does a very poor job of telling people, normal people, that, hey, this is where you go to get these answers. Contacts, so again, we're talking about address book type information, contacts, documents in the cloud. Okay. Finding your friends, so that's another cloud service. iCloud Keychain, this is where we're getting into where Keychain, which is an Apple service that's a local service on your Mac or on your iOS device where it'll remember your logins for websites or it'll remember credit card numbers. Uh, in some cases, uh, Apple Pay stuff is linked to this. You can have that where that's being shared across machines. Don't recommend it yet, but you know, it's coming down the pipe. I work for iCloud, that's pages, keynote, numbers, data. Example, when I brought up the text edit page with the raffle numbers, I was not bringing it from my computer, I was bringing it in from my iCloud storage. And then last, uh, mail and notes. And let me just tell them, no, I don't want to provide answers. All right, then we get down to these very last two items, service status and contact support. If you click contact support, you're going to end up in a chat mode if they're available where you can type questions, get some sort of response back. But this is the other one I want you to look at. And so it was the thing in the sidebar next to last at the bottom where it said service status. These are all iCloud services. They're showing all green. Okay, this is a timeline. Think stoplight. Red, yellow, green. Is it working or not working? This is when, where I can go to see if there's a problem on Apple's end with a particular service. If I see all green, I know, okay, go forward with my troubleshooting. We'll come back to that one again. Just remember, this is the easiest way to get to that status screen. From www.apple.com slash support slash iCloud. Next to last item in the sidebar. Okay. Now, let me go back here just for a second. So I went back to the section where they talk about Apple ID accounts. I'm going to just click on this first item. This is another whole section of the Apple website just for finding out what's going on with your Apple ID. For example, let's say your password doesn't work anymore. How are you going to get back into that account? This is how you would get into there. And there's all these different troubleshooting helps that they have there. Again, notice that they're using this sidebar <coughs> metaphor. So the first one says welcome, then they talk basics, where they talk about Apple IDs, then they talk about passwords for Apple IDs. Managing your account, multiple accounts. Just imagine if you're a school administrator 
and you've deployed all of these iPads, maybe, you know, 500 iPads, and you want to buy programs for teachers to use and students to use, how do you manage all that stuff? I'm looking at Mark George as he volunteers at a local school where he does some of that. Security and privacy, and again, contact support. The last but not least, sign into my Apple ID. So, lots and lots of tools there, lots and lots of information. They even laid it out pretty much so that normal people can find an answer to the question that they have. Okay, much, much better than, you know, pray for me every time I go on Microsoft TechNet and I'm looking for an answer to a question. They're getting better over at Microsoft, but they got a long way to go. Okay. So, back to our presentation. Okay. So, <coughs> unbelievable amount of resources to answer questions, solve problems, <coughs> on this one little part of the Apple website, www.apple.com slash support slash iCloud. Remember, you're going to get a little link that you can just click on. It'll take you there. Okay. Yeah, I know. I've said that six times now. That's a clue. That's important. All right, so that was the little demo that I wanted to do so you can see it. Now we're going to get to the other part. We've done three of the four things so far. I told you about the uh, detailed troubleshooting documents you were going to be getting. They were emailing to you. I showed you those two books that were out there. And then I was showing you the online resources that are available from Apple at www.apple.com slash support slash iCloud. I'm screaming at this point. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the paradigm the paradigm. The thing you want to have in your head when you're trying to troubleshoot this stuff. Now, before we can do that, let's just sort of talk about what iCloud is supposed to be doing, the benefit. Because you can't tell what's wrong unless you know how it's supposed to work. So, main benefit of iCloud is to automatically sync data between your devices. Okay, and just a reminder, they can be Macs, PCs, so, you know, a Windows PC, iPads, iTouch, you know, uh, iPad, iPod iTouches, and iPhones. In other words, most computers and most Apple mobile devices. Okay, so just for this example, data most commonly synced typically is going to be address book, contact information, calendar events, or other app data. What is the device at the upper left there? Um, so the upper left, that's supposed to, this is, a, this is a legacy slide. That, that is an, uh, an iPod Touch early version that wasn't released. And the thing behind it was another device from Apple that didn't get Okay. It is not a droid. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that's what's supposed to happen, right? Okay. So now this is my big thing. This is the paradigm. This is going to help you figure stuff out. You ready? Think plumbing. Think plumbing. The data that you want to sync, that's water. And the connections between devices, there's like pipes, tubes, okay? And stuff gets clogged. Somebody's holding the hose, you know? Waiting for you to look in the end and then they're going to let it go. <laughs> think plumbing. <laughs> don't think internet. Don't think, you know, uh, file transfer. Don't think any of that stuff. Just think plumbing. You want to get the data to flow. Okay, so let's go back to our little design here. Now let's walk through what's supposed to happen. All right, in my little chart up here, I want you to look in that lower left-hand corner where it shows an iMac and it says home underneath it. 
All right, so you're at home, and you're at, sitting at your iMac, and you go, oh, hey, I redid the Christmas card list, and so-and-so, and Inga's got a new address, so I'm going to take out the old address, put in the new address. And you're in contacts or address book if you're in Snow Leopard still, and you're taking out the old address, putting in the new address, you update Okay. The way iCloud is supposed to work is once you do that, your Mac goes, hey, this is one of my iCloud applications, and they got new data in it. They changed something. So the Mac should start to talk to iCloud.com. Okay, that's the thing that's sort of showing there with a silver, with a cloud. It's sort of in the middle up there. And the Mac is going to push that new information into your storage locker on iCloud.com and update it. <coughs> then your Mac, once it finishes doing that, uh, typically your Mac will do other stuff too. It'll say, oh, I'm also supposed to be syncing calendars, I'm supposed to be doing this. It'll do all those, push that new data up. Then it's going to talk to iCloud.com again and it's going to pull down the new information that's in iCloud. All right. Now, later on in the day, you can turn off your Mac, you're not at home, you go to work, you're over in the lower right, now you're sitting at your PC at work, and you have downloaded and installed the iCloud control panel, and you configured it, and you put your contact information. So this PC talks to iCloud.com. You turn on that PC, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to look to see if it has new information on it that's supposed to sync with iCloud. It's going to push that information up, a copy of it, up to iCloud. And then it's going to pull down new information that iCloud has that it doesn't have. Now, the important thing with all this is you have those other devices, maybe your phone, your smart, you know, iPhone or your tablet, they're going to do it when you have them turned on also. So they're going to do the same thing. But notice, your devices do not talk directly to each other. They talk to iCloud. iCloud then talks to them. They don't talk to each other directly. And that's the key to iCloud troubleshooting. They only talk to the iCloud.com website. Okay. All right. So in terms of a very <coughs> simplified process, the first thing you do is you want to make sure and see what data is actually making it to iCloud. All right, so you know you've got a device. It's supposed to send push data. It's supposed to pull data. Maybe it's pushing, but it's not pulling. Maybe it's pulling, but it's not pushing. Well, the only way to know is to look at the reference data set. And the reference data set is not your iMac, not your Mac Mini, not your PC, not your iPhone, not your iPad, not your iPad Mini. None of those. It's the iCloud data set. Okay. So, step one. You go to www.apple.com slash support slash iCloud. Okay? So now you're there. Then what you're going to do is you're going to scroll down to the next to last item on that web page and click service status. So you're going to get something like this. And you're going to see green lights, okay? Red lights, yellow lights. You know, what's working, what isn't working. What's down for maintenance, what isn't down for maintenance. Okay? So let's say the problem is moving calendar information. Well, you look for, oh, let's see. iCloud calendar. Hey, green lights. So we know Apple stuff is working. Yes, Ron? These green lights are that the Apple iCloud system is green or red, or is this that whatever device you're using? It's to look not at your this, stuff; it's their stuff. 
okay, it's them, not Correct. your computer. There, you know, you've got these huge data centers <coughs> that they built. It's those data centers. Are they doing what they're supposed to do, or do they have a service outage? It's sort of like you know, you turn on the large screen TV and you want to watch a movie, and all you're getting is fuzz and static. Okay, well you go, oh, wait a minute, is it my TV, is it my connection, or is it the cable company? But there's nothing like this that says your computer is no. sick. No. Okay. no. Okay, so once you check this, you go, okay, their stuff is working, now I know that the problem's got to be on my end. Okay. It's so one of the devices isn't set up right, or it's confused, you've got a clock pipe. Okay. This is where you get into those troubleshooting documents that we're emailing to you, because that's got the procedure, and it's, these are long, you know, check this, check that, check this, check this. I mean, four pages worth of stuff. And they walk you through what the procedure is, if it's a PC, if it's in iOS device, if it's an OSX device, and they'll have separate things for if it's Mountain Lion or it's Mavericks or your 7 Really dull, boring stuff you don't want me to read to you. So, in terms of our paradigm, you're thinking plumbing, you're thinking what's working, what isn't working, you've gone to the Apple website, you've now checked service status, so you know the water tower is working, the Apple stuff is working, the next step is we go look at iCloud, your storage log. So you take a web browser and you go to www.icloud.com. This is the login screen for it. And you're going to put in your Apple ID and your Apple ID password. Okay. If it won't let you log in and you go, wait a minute, I just bought something on iTunes with this Apple ID, or I just bought an app with this Apple ID, or I just bought, you know, then you know that iTunes knows that this is a valid ID, but you've never set up iCloud. And at that point, you would click that, you would get the error message, and it would say, hey, do you want to set up iCloud? In other words, you didn't have a storage locker set up on iCloud.com. You had the stuff over in iTunes, you had the stuff over in the iBook store, you had the stuff over in the iOS app store, you had the stuff over in the OS X app store. I know, it gets confusing. But you didn't have your storage locker set up. So you've eliminated one more possibility. If you're able to log in, then you know, hey, iCloud, I do have a storage locker. And you go to the next step. So when you're logged in, with your web browser, and again, your choice of web browser, this is what you're going to see. So let's say it's a problem with contacts. You click on contacts, and it's going to show you what your contacts are that it has. And typically what I'll do is I'll scroll all the way down to the bottom of the contact list, and see how many contacts it is. It'll say, you know, so many contacts, 973, 974, for me. I don't get my full Farley file. Okay. Well, let's say the problem is a calendar. Okay. You click on calendar, and it shows you what it's got. So you can tell what your reference database, the reference iCloud store blocker has got. Then you look at your device, you go, okay, wait a minute, the device says this, the device has that, it doesn't have this, it doesn't have that. It gives you an idea of where the problem is. And let me just back up for a second. If you're doing other stuff, like um, when you were talking about notes, your notes are you know, see if the notes is, is set, if you've got notes up there or not. <clears throat> Typically when you don't, it means that you never turned on that you want to sync notes from this device to iCloud. Or if you would turn that process on. 
Okay, so let me just do the review one more time. Again, I'm not going into a lot of detail. I'm giving you an overview of the troubleshooting process. So first, you would check that iCloud <coughs> service status. Is Apple's gerbils all in their wheels, running around the way they should? Then, can you log into iCloud.com? And you're using a web browser to do that. You're using your Apple ID, your Apple password. Okay, if you can't, then you know it's an ID problem. If you're able to log in, check your data and see what data is showing up there. So typically what I'll do is I'll take, uh, let's say I've got two devices. And I'm not sure where the problem is. I'll take the iPad and I'll, I'll change an address setting. Okay, and then I'll tell it to refresh and then I'll go look and see if, oh, did iCloud get it? So then I know, oh, the iPad is talking to iCloud. Okay, that part's working. Then I'll change something on iCloud because when you're logged into iCloud, you can modify your data too. Then I'll look and see, oh, did it send it down to the iPad? Okay, so I know push and pull to the iPad. <coughs> then I'll go over to my Mac. I'll turn the Mac on and see if it's got those changes also. Remember, the devices don't talk to each other directly. They're going through iCloud. So that's the checking the data flow from one device at a time. And then last but not least, where do you go to look at what the iCloud settings are on different types of devices? On Macs, so that could be MacBooks, Mac Minis, iMacs, Mac Pros, all of the Mac computers. You're going to go into System Preferences to iCloud. And that iCloud control pane is where you turn on stuff. Okay. That's where you can say, oh, yeah, you know, I want to have this synchronized from this device. I want this to go. I want to synchronize bookmarks or not synchronize bookmarks. On iOS devices, you're going to go to your settings app, and in the sidebar, you're going to scroll down to where it says iCloud. And that's where you set what that iPad, what kind of data is that iPad supposed to be sharing, or that iPhone is supposed to be sharing. And last but not least, on PCs, you're going to go into your control panels, and you're going to look for the iCloud control panel, and you're going to see what it's set up to do. Again, if you're trying to do iCloud with a PC, and you go to control panels, and there's no iCloud control panel there, that means you need to download it, install it, and then put in the information it needs, which typically is your Apple ID and your Apple password, and then you check off what data you want to sync and what data you don't want to sync. Okay. So we did four things today. The first one was to tell you about these detailed troubleshooting documents that we're going to send you. These are all uh, from the Apple website, but I figured you won't go to the Apple website unless there's a problem, but if I send you the documents, you'll at least look at them. Among those documents, there's also a file that, when you click on it, takes you to the Apple www.apple slash support slash iCloud. So you don't have to type it in. And then last but not least, a copy of this presentation where you get the slide and then the verbiage that I normally you don't see that's underneath that I'm reading. Or my reminders of what I'm supposed to say when you see the slide. Okay. Second thing we did was two books that if you're interested in learning more about iCloud and how it works and where they think you're going to take it, take control of iCloud and then the visual quick start guide for iCloud. And then we looked at the <coughs> Apple Support Center for iCloud. There are literally more than 120 articles <coughs> up there and there's all of these little troubleshooting wizards that are up there. 
So it, it gets you direct to flight. And if, if you still can't resolve the problem, you go to the very last thing on that sidebar, which says contact support, and you'll end up either in a direct chat or you'll end up in an email situation where you can send them questions. And then last but not least, the paradigm. So when you're doing iCloud troubleshooting, think plumbing, think pipes. I'm not getting water to flow between one spot or the other. A valve is turned off, or a valve is turned on, or a hose is tamped. Okay, that's what those configurations are all about. Okay, so I'm hoping that this will be more helpful to you than going through a click here, check this, click there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, remember when your devices are syncing data, they never talk to each other directly. They're all talking to the iCloud first. Mm -hmm.